Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well and stay safe at home. My name is Manon Desforges. I'm doing my master's degree in psychology at University of Montreal. And today I'll be talking about TMSCG as a measure of the intermittent theta bear stimulation mechanism in the prefrontal cortex. So in our lab, we are working on optimizing the treatment of major depressive disorder because more than 300 million people are living with depression in 2017, according to the World Health Organization. So it's about 4.4% of the world's population. And unfortunately, one third of patients fail to respond to antidepressive therapy. So there is a real need for alternative treatments and measure to assess the effectiveness of those treatments. And this is exactly what we're working on. We are most specifically interested in the treatment of depression using a technique called TMS. So what is TMS? Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a neurostimulation tool where a cord placed over the skull stimulates the brain region underneath with a magnetic field. How does it work exactly? Uh, well, according to Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, a magnetic field generates an electric current. So, by applying a magnetic field over the skull, through a TMS coil, we are also inducing an electric current, and this current will lead to a neuron depolarization. And the magic of this tool is that we can use it in two different ways. Firstly, we can use it to measure the brain activity. For example, if we stimulate the motor cortex, then we can record the muscular activity with electrode plates on the person's finger. And secondly, when the TMS is applied repeatedly, it's then called RTMS or repetitive TMS. It allows to modulate brain activity beyond the stimulation period. And this RTMS technique is exactly used as a treatment of depression. So let's talk about this RTMS treatment. Um, well, the RTMS standard protocol involves stimulation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC, for 20 to 45 minutes from Monday to Friday for four to six weeks. And it's been shown to be effective to treat depression, but it's very time consuming. Fortunately, in 2005, a new form of RTMS was developed, the theta burst stimulation, or TBS. And this technique allows to reduce the stimulation duration down to three minutes and to stimulate at lower intensity. And the recent large trial showed comparable efficacy compared to the standard RTMS. So it's really promising. One of the different TBS protocol is the intermittent TBS or ITBS. It consists of three bursts of 50 Hertz pulses repeated at a five Hertz frequency. And although it is already used in clinical practice, the optimal duration of stimulation is unknown. The standard ITBS protocol is 600 pulses. So it's around three minutes stimulation, but there is an increase in duration based on the assumption that it will increase the therapeutic effects. For example, some studies are applying 1200 pulses or even 1800 pulses. So the aim of this study is to determine the optimal ITBS duration to activate the left DLPFC out of the three most commonly used duration, 600, 1200, and 1800 pulses. So let's now talk about the methodology. Uh, we have recruited 14 right-handed healthy participants, half men and half women, court average was around 26 years old. And I want to bring your attention to the fact that our participants were healthy controls. They were not diagnosed with depression. And it may look counterintuitive to test non-depressive people to assess the efficacy of, the, of a depressive treatment. But the idea is that we firstly want to understand how the healthy subject brain works before applying it to depressive subjects. Here is the list of the equipment we used. Um, a neural navigation system was used to target the left PFC. The specific MNI coordinates were based on a previous uh, study and corresponds to the area around F3 here. And the participant's brain was modelized thanks to a standard MNI brain model. Then we used a combination of TMS and electroencephalography or TMS-EG to record the cortical activity. So TMS-EG allows to quantify cortical excitability changes induced by TBS outside the motor cortex. 
So we are sending a TMS pulse and we record the electrophysiological response produced by the pulse with a 64 TMS compatible channel EG cap, like this one here. The response evoked by the TMS, called TMS evoked potential, or TEP, consists of a series of positives and negative deflections lasting up to 300 milliseconds. TEP is composed of various characteristic cortical responses associated to components such as P30, N45, P60, and 100, and so on. TP can also capture additional neurophysiological information, such as the event-related spectral perturbation, or ERSP, when we can observe the change following ITBS in the time frequency domain. Each participant underwent the three different durations of ITBS, so either 600 pulses, 1200 pulses, or 1800 pulses, during three different sessions, separated by at least seven days. The session order was randomized and counterbalanced across participants. And for each session, we took TMS EEG measures before ITBS. It was 80 single pulses. Then ITBS was applied, and then we took the same TMS EEG measures after ITBS. About the TMS EEG pre-processing, data were pre-processed with MATLAB, EEG Lab, and Filtrip. Data were epoch around the TMS poles and baseline corrected. After noisy channel and epoch removal, we apply an interpolation for missing data. We also perform two rounds of uh, independent component analysis or ICA. A first ICA to remove the TMS artifact and a second ICA to remove other artifacts such as eyes movement, muscle activation, and so on. And then we also apply a bandpass filter and a notch filter, and we finally re-reference data to the average of the scalp electrode, of all scalp electrodes. Um, all statistical analyses were conducted on a specific region of interest, including five electrodes, AF3, F1, F3, FT1, and FT3. We conduct two linear mixed models with condition and time as within subject factors one for each TP of interest, so P30, N45, P60, N100, and P200, and one for each frequency of interest, so theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. A p-value under 0.05 was considered as significant, and cheeky post hoc t-tests with bond Fermi correction were also conducted. So let's now talk about our results. Uh, so for TP, we found that none of the three stimulation durations was superior in modulating the amplitude of TPs. Uh, however, the three ITBS durations significantly modified the majority of the components. So X axis represent the time in milliseconds, Y axis represent the amplitude in microvolts, um, Y axis is set at time zero and corresponds to the TMS pulse, the green curve show the activity of all conditions before TBS and the blue one after TBS, and the star indicate a significant effect of time. So P30 is an index of cortical excitability, and our results suggest that ITBS significantly reduced its amplitude. N45 components seems to be associated with cortical inhibition, and our results demonstrate a significant increase in the amplitude of N45. It's a negative component, so it's reversed, suggesting that ITBS would increase the inhibition of healthy subjects. As P30, P60 seems to be associated with excitability, and our results show a decrease of P60 amplitudes following ITBS. And this would have promising clinical perspective as a recent TMS EG study reported that P60 amplitude of the left DLPFC is significantly larger in depressive people than in healthy control. N100 seems to be associated with inhibitory mechanism and more specifically with GABA-V. Our results do not show significant differences in its amplitude, suggesting that the ITBS would not modulate N100 inhibition. Uh, studies suggest that the N100 can be confounded with the auditory artifact, which may explain the lack of significant results, even though we, we used uh, a white noise to mask the sound. And finally, P200 seems to be associated with cortical excitability. 
Consistently with P30 and P60, a decrease of its amplitude is observed. And um, it suggests that the mechanism of prefrontal uh, ITBS may differ from the motor cortex, where an increase of cortical excitability is observed. So now the ERSP results. So x-axis represent the time in milliseconds, y-axis represent the frequency in hertz, time zero represent the TMS pulse. On the left, you can see the activity of all conditions before TBS, and on the right, you can see it after. And black boxes represent um, the hour frequency band of interest with their specific time windows. So our results uh, show that none of the three stimulation duration was superior in modulating the power of ERSP. However, the three ITBS durations significantly modify uh, theta bands, uh, where we observe a decrease of theta power following ITBS. For alpha, we found a trend for an effect of time suggesting that uh, the power of the ERSP was reduced post ITBS and no significant results were found for beta and gamma. So a couple of things to remember about this talk. Uh, TMS can be both used as a treatment tool and as a measuring tool. TMS EG is a promising technique for determining the optimal parameters of stimulation of the DLPFC for clinical applications. Results show no difference between 600, 1200, or 1800 pulses, ITBS pulses, on the modulation of cortical accessibility. It suggests that increasing the duration of stimulation may not be related to increased clinical efficacy, but this will need to be replicated in a in clinical sample. And yeah, so that was my master degree thesis where we looked at the optimal duration of ITBS stimulation. And for my PhD thesis next year, I'm gonna look at the optimal paradigm uh, of stimulation. So either unilateral or bilateral stimulation. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Sarah Tremblay for her amazing supervision, Dr. Itaya Das for his precious help, Dr. Martin Lepage and Dr. Jeff Descalakis, as well as all the contributors of this project. And thank you for watching this video. Bye-bye. Take care.